Well, good morning. You know, I have now fulfilled one of my boyhood dreams. I have a slot in the morning as a lounge act on a cruise ship. I mean, what could be better? Um, who's here today? I mean, how many attorneys are in the room? Anybody that's, okay, I see a few attorneys. The rest of you, all financial advisors? Is that it? Okay. Well, what, why would you listen to me? What's a financial advisor got to learn from an attorney? We're both professionals. We both have the same sort of concerns. And there's been a lot of positive talk here this morning. And um, I'm getting the signal. I, I'm an expressive sort of guy, so holding a microphone is, uh, is not natural for me. So keep reminding me if I, if I uh, move my hands too much. So why, what would you have to learn from me? Well, we're all professionals, and I've got some bad news. And then I've got some really great news because of the bad news. As a matter of fact, it says, what do you have in common? Well, most of you will be out of business in the next seven years. It's 2013 right now. That means 2020, that's not that far away. What could possibly put attorneys, financial advisors, and all kinds of other professionals absolutely out of business? That's what I'm going to talk about, and it's something that most people are not even aware of. It's a huge, huge trend that's going on right now, and it's accelerating rapidly. I'm assuming that... There we go. Well, let me tell you a story. Uh, I've been practicing law since 1976, and the uh, gentleman on the slide with me is Sanford Fish. He's a co-founder of the Academy as well. And we, in uh, the 1980s, had been so successful in creating estate planning law firms that we had 12 firms throughout California and Arizona. We could fly into a city on a weekend, rent some space, and be up and running the next week in any kind of location. And we were doing very, very well in the 1980s, and then a friend of ours gave us a book, a book many of you have probably read, it's called The E-Myth, Why Most Small Businesses Don't Work and What to Do About It. How many of you read that book? A number of you have. It's one of the seminal business classics by Michael Gerber. And Michael Gerber said the E-Myth is the entrepreneurial myth. And the entrepreneurial myth is that people who have technical skills think they can open up a business that provides those services. So for example, a great lawyer opens up a law firm. A great financial advisor opens up a financial advisory firm. A great poodle clipper opens up a poodle clipping firm. A great carpenter becomes a subcontractor. And the entrepreneurial myth is that completely different skills are required from being a technician to owning a business. Now, how many here own their own businesses? Okay, most of you do, so this is gonna resonate with you a lot today. Because once we read that book, a whole new world opened up for us. And we started systematizing everything. Because Michael Gerber is a big believer and you've gotta have a system for everything. If you do something more than two times, you wanna have a system for it. So we ripped apart our practice. We systematized our marketing. We systematized how the phones were answered. We systematized how consultations were done. We systematized how documents were drafted. We systematized every single thing in the firm. And the results were extraordinary. The efficiency, the productivity, the revenues just soared once we did that. And then in the 1980s, the late 1980s, we said, you know, maybe some other people would like to know exactly what we did. They would like to know what our systems are. They would like to know exactly how to create a practice that works. And so we created the American Academy of Estate Planning Attorney started in 1992, rolled it out in 1993, and we're coming up on our 20th anniversary. Now, I've got nothing to sell you today, I apologize. Keep your checkbooks, your credit cards, whatever, I've got nothing to sell you. But what I hope I can do is give you some tips and some strategies that don't necessarily focus on marketing, but focus on mindset and running a professional practice, and focus on being very, very efficient in what you do. Because the amount of gross revenue that bring, you bring in has absolutely no relevance to the amount of money that you take home in your paycheck. 
And we've seen attorneys we've counseled who are bringing in lots of money and then we ask them what their owner's comp is and it's ridiculous. It's very, very low. So we're gonna tell you some, some things today that will change all of that. So there are some of the uh, American Academy members in the room if you wanna find out what all these systems are about in more detail because I have a limited amount of time. Talk to them and they will tell you exactly how to systematize a practice. Well, that's all good. That's great. 1980s, things were going fine. 1990s, things were going fine. And then this wonderful thing called Google, which is just a proxy for the introduction of all knowledge out there being available to everyone. And Google has full access to a world of knowledge. Now, why is that important? It's important because we are the holders of specialized information. We are the people who have the training, the expertise, and we know the secret words, the secret language, the secret strategies that the general public doesn't know. Google has changed all of that. And it wasn't always that way. As a matter of fact, what happened in the Middle Ages is that there were guilds that grew up around all of the various commerce activities. If you're making candles, if you're making dye, if you're a horseshoer, if you're doing all kinds of things, you would actually be an apprentice and you would learn the secret language and you would spend years, no one else could learn that language but you. And amazingly enough, from the Middle Ages to the 1960s and 70s, that was the state of the law. That was the state of the world as far as professionals were concerned. We had the secret knowledge. And then along comes Robert Noyce and Jack Kilby in 1959, and they created something that we didn't know it at the time, which completely changed the landscape of everything we do. And that was the invention of the microchip. And the microchip changed every facet of society. As a matter of fact, in 1965, Gordon, uh, Gordon Moore created the Moore's Law. And the Moore's Law says that every 18 months, the amount of transistors on a microchip will double. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but right now we're approaching 10 billion transistors to every single microchip. And to put it in language that you may be able to understand or concepts you may be able to understand, because who knows 10 billion? But five years ago, in fact, it's just six years ago, this month was the introduction of the iPhone by Steve Jobs, 2007. You could buy an iPhone in 2007 with four gigabytes of memory. It was $499. In 2012, they introduced the iPhone 5, 64 gigabytes of memory and only $399. A 16-fold increase in just five years. Well, that's happening everywhere in society. And we professionals are the ones that really are not aware of it. If you look at the rapid growth of technology, if we're a golf ball today in 2013, by 2040, it will be the size of the sun. Now, what does that mean for you? I mean, who could even grasp those kinds of concepts? What does that kind of technological growth have to do with you, financial advisors or attorneys or CPAs or other professionals? It just means that all of the knowledge that's out there and those who are focused on technical knowledge will be replaced. And they'll be replaced by expert systems and artificial intelligence. We're not talking science fiction here. It's already here. And I want to go through just some of these perils out there. If you're relying on your technical knowledge, if you're relying on your expertise or your hoarding of the information that the public doesn't have, you're going to be in sad shape going forward. And the, actual name of it is something called disintermediation. It's where they cut out the middleman. And you, my friends, are the middlemen. And you just have to ask bookstores or bank tellers or consumer tax returns for CPAs, travel agents, music stores, software, computer hardware, attorneys and financial advisors. We are in the sights of all of these expert systems. We are in the sights of artificial intelligence. And if anything can re result from a system 
or a way of looking at a problem and you have input, then a computer can do it far better than a professional can. The purpose of, a, of an economy is to turn everything into a commodity. Everything is reduced to a commodity, like eggs and gas and milk, electricity, copper, water, generic drugs, and my friends, it also includes professional services. And if you don't believe me, most professionals are in denial. We've got special status, we think, because we provide irreplaceable services. After all, we've got all of the training, all of the education, the years of experience, but that's all about to be dismissed. The attorneys in the room, the big evil giant out there is something called LegalZoom. And LegalZoom is out there providing direct response to the, to the market and they are trying to get people to not go to lawyers, but just dial a number and absolutely get great documents. And you see the guy holding his nose. That's what attorneys think. Those documents are Mickey Mouse documents. They're not as good as the documents created by attorneys with all of these years of experience. After all, look at a living trust, $249. How appealing is that to the general public? Well, these are the ads. Let's say you need to take care of legal matters. Wouldn't it be nice if there was an easier, less expensive option than using a traditional lawyer? Well, LegalZoom came up with a better way. We took the best of the old and combined it with modern technology. Together, you get quality services on your terms with total customer support. LegalZoom documents are accepted in all 50 states, and they're backed by a 100% satisfaction guarantee. So go to LegalZoom.com today and see for yourself. It's law. It just makes sense. And that's what they're doing. In every sports show, every Sunday, every Saturday, they are saturating the airwaves with those commercials. You've all seen them. And you say, well, wait a minute. Do consumers buy that stuff? Will they go to somebody and bypass an attorney with all that training? Well, one of the big uh, um, commentators in the legal field, an attorney named Rich Richard Granite, he says, consumers don't seem to care. What they get from LegalZoom is good enough, and the numbers tell the story. And by the way, the documents that we're holding our noses about right now will only get better as technology moves on. Here's some of the statistics. 2011, 490,000 orders were placed through their website. 20% of all California limited liability companies are done by LegalZoom. Two million customers served during the past 10 years and $156 million in revenue in 2011. This is big Wall Street money. This is venture capital money. And you say, yeah, but that's for attorneys. We don't have to worry as financial advisors. Hey, financial advice is too complex for consumers. They need us. Well, Mr. and Ms. Financial Planner, not so fast. Here we go, the top five, Schwab, Ameritrade, Fidelity, Scott Trade, and E-Trade, they are out there and they're called direct access. They are going right to the consumers right now with a message, relentless direct advertisements. Dump your advisor, save money, you don't need them, do it direct. Are they spending money to do that? You bet they are. I know, your portfolio's down. <laughs> Everybody's hurting. <laughs> Driver, I need to pick up my dry cleaning. You're a huckleberry. But switching to Scott Trade? <laughs> what are you gonna do? Pick your stocks yourself? <laughs> yeah, I know they have tons of online research, but you and me, we go way back. Why spoil the fun? <laughs> the fun. Come to Scott Trade. With the tools, research, and support we provide, you'll wonder why you worked with anyone else. <laughs> the fun. <laughs> Scott Trade, get invested. And it is so much fun for lawyers to see some other profession get vilified <clears throat> because we, we have suffered for so long. But that financial advisor doesn't look like the kind of guy that you'd want to do business with, does he? And they are relentlessly spending money. And how much money are they spending? $250 million, each of them, every year. That's more than a billion dollars to saturate the airfares the airways to absolutely get rid of you, bypass you, and go direct. Well, how are they doing? 
2008 to 2010, just two years, they went from 2.7 trillion to 3.7 trillion. These are your clients. This is, these are your clients' money that's going direct and bypassing them. And not only that, they've already grown larger than all of the financial advisors around. The wirehouses are a bit ahead right now. Direct access is next. And they're bigger than all of the advisors in the country. And they've only been around a few years. If you're not worried about people taking your business through technology and direct access, then you really are going to be one of those professionals out of business. And what's also interesting is that people who work with an advisor and the advisor thinks they've got all the money, they've done surveys and they find that 76% of the clients actually have money on the side that they've got with direct access providers bypassing the financial advisor. So, expert systems, you want to get big expert systems? Talk to Ken Jennings. How humiliated was he when he was destroyed on Jeopardy by Watson, the IBM supercomputer? And the IBM supercomputer is a big deal, not because it's smart, but because it's now mastered natural language. Not just the answers to the capital of France, but they can tell what a joke is. They can tell the subtle nuances of speech. They can take a answer and turn it around into a question. And this is only getting better, as we said, a golf ball to the size of the sun. Watson is now going to Sloan Kettering. They're going to Wall Street. They're going to WellPoint. And what are we all to do? Pretty bad news when you look at it. Computers, robots, I don't know whether you saw last week's 60 Minutes. The whole show was about the replacement of people because of robots and computers. This week's Fortune magazine was a whole article about the robots are coming. So what do you do? Like Microsoft used to say years ago, surrender because resistance is futile. No, you don't want to do that. You should throw up your hands and surrender in the face of the inevitability of it all? No. You're all here today. You are all experts in your field. You are all terrifically successful. Otherwise, you wouldn't be on, on, in on this cruise. So there is a way to take that knowledge that's being accumulated by expert systems and use it for yourself. Because you want to resist the commodity label. You want to not be just another you fill in the blank. And yet in the public's eyes, almost all of you are just another financial advisor, just another CPA, just another attorney. You've done nothing to differentiate yourself. And some of the earlier speakers have talked at great length about how to differentiate yourself in this kind of a world. So, I've got three simple strategies for you today to take advantage of all of the increases in the expert systems and knowledge that's available now and is coming fast down the track. I want you to embrace a new vision for your firm. I want you to create a client transformational experience and I want you to leverage the power of unique ability teams. The first thing you have to do is get rid of that technician's hat that you've been holding on to. The one where you quote code sections, the one where you worry about the construction of portfolios. I'm not saying not do that, but that's not where the money is if you're the owner of the firm. Where the money is is in deep personal relationships. And this is what technology cannot do. This is what Watson cannot do or any of the other expert systems. They cannot counteract people. Human beings need to belong. Their need to be relieved of responsibility. Their need to be led. And best of all, their need for the deep, trusting, long-term relationships. Finally, step if five, that's where you focus your firm, assessment. developing those relationships, that will be the antidote to uh, all of the, 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 the surges in technology. We want you to imagine and reimagine your firm as an instrument of your self-expression. Now, I'm going to get a little woo-woo here on you, but all of you, when you created your own firms, you didn't just want to be another financial advisor. You wanted to have something that was absolutely special, didn't you? 
You wanted to have a place that reflected you, your values, your hopes, your dreams, your ability to serve your clients, your ability to serve the community. Isn't that what all of you wanted? And yet the sad truth of the matter is, is that most, most law firms, most CPAs, and most financial advisors are cookie cutter images of everyone else on the street. All you have to do is go to the yellow pages, if there's still any yellow pages around, kind of squint your eyes and go through the ads. Everybody looks the same. You're all the same. And here, your self-expression has been lost. So what we want you to do is have a whole new view of your practice. Your practice is a value-creating machine. That's what you're about. You're creating value in every single thing you do. This is not a place to sign documents, your business. It's not a place to create financial plans. No, your business is not a place to put food on your table or for you to pay the rent. And sadly, that's the way a lot of you think your businesses are for, to earn a living, to protect your family, to survive in this world. We're saying no. If you want to really thrive in this world, this is what you have to do. You have to create an invitation to enter a world that you created. This is your self-expression, a place where you're not just another CPA, attorney, or financial advisor. And this is what you say, you build systems in your firm, systems for every single thing that you do, every area of your practice. And you can then say, this is the way we answer phones here. This is how we generate estate and financial plans here. This is how we stay in touch with clients here. This is how we greet clients here. This is how we conduct client meetings here. Do you get the idea? In every single area of your practice, you want to put your stamp on it, your self-expression, your system, so that when somebody comes in to the Anderson Law Firm or the Anderson Financial Advisory Firm, it will not be a cookie-cutter example of going into the, the Fleischer Law Firm or the Fleischer Estate Planning Firm. And it's going to require some work by all of you to make that happen. You have to look at your practice as not a transactional one. You don't sell an annuity. You don't put money under management. You don't do any of those things that involve a transaction, one-time deal. What you want to do, your new purpose of business, is to create deep personal relationships. So when you get up in the morning, you don't say, God, I hope I saw, sell five annuities today. You say, what I hope to do is create deep relationships with five new people today. Because once you do that, they will buy everything that you have to offer. And you don't get a client to make a sale. That's the old paradigm. Hey, I got a client because I made a sale. The new paradigm is you make a sale to get a client to get a client, because that's just the beginning of the relationship. That's just the beginning of your conduct and your relationship and influence with that client, because this will allow you, as we say to all of the attorneys in the academy, this is a way for you to create a multi-generational practice. Not just the clients in front of you, but their children, their grandchildren, their friends, their family, everyone in their influence because they have a relationship with you that's different than anyone else. How do you do that? Well, first of all, you remember Shakespeare said, all the world's a play, life is but a, but a play. Well. Theatrical experience. How many of you have ever thought about your business as a theatrical experience for a client? A way for a client to walk into an office and enter into a world that you've created. And it's theater. It's not nuts and bolts and code sections. It's not indexes and, 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 um, and other kinds of ways we measure things. Although that's part of it. The main thing is, is that your clients walk into your office with a movie playing on what they think should be happening there. Are you living up to that movie? Or better still, do you take that movie and then one-up them? Do you take somebody who wants A and you transform their desires to want a whole lot more? That's what we're talking about here today. Not a little bit better, as someone said earlier today. We're talking about transformation. And if you don't transform your firms now, by the time technology gets done with you, it will be too late. 
Also, you don't want to have a generic form for doing your uh, estate planning, for doing your financial services. People come in and say, well, what do you do for a living? Well, I create estate plans. Oh, I do financial plans. I'm a financial planner. A big problem with lawyers is people want a living trust, a revocable inter vivos trust, and they call up and they say to, this, to, the, uh, to the gal who answers the phone or the guy who answers the phone, they say, how much is a living trust here? And the person gives them the answer, they put the phone down, they call someplace else. You want to make sure that nobody can call and ask about your services and get an answer that is apples to apples. You want to make sure that you have a complete brandable process, something that is unique to your firm, so that when they call, you don't say how much is a, they say how much is an, a, a, a revocable trust. You say, well, no, the documents are free. We don't charge for the documents. We have a complete system that we take you through to give you peace of mind for your family. Would you like to come in and find out about the Academy six-step estate planning process? Now, the first step is we have a consultation and roadmap. And the second step, step is we have plan design. And then we have plan development. And then last, lifetime communication and updates. Now that's a whole lot different as how much do you charge for a revocable living trust or a living trust, isn't it? Well, what's the example in your firm when somebody calls and asks to do something in the financial arena? What is your brandable process? What is your unique vision of creating a, a, a theatrical experience for the clients or the prospects who come in contact with you? I also want to pay careful attention to the materials that you present to them. It's got to be congruent. It, everything that you do is congruent with this message that this is a theatrical experience, that on the front stage where the client meets with you, everything is going to be congruent with that experience. So you want to make sure that you've got binders and carrying bags and shock and awe packages. You've got everything that's branded. In our attorneys, what we have them do is we have tote bags, we have special signing pens, we have warm muffins in, the, in the, uh, uh, the room where they sign the documents. Once they sign their final documents, we have a, somebody come in and take a picture of them signing their documents. We frame it and then send it out to the client so they have a memento of something that they've been putting off for 30 or 40 or 50 years. It's doing those kinds of things that create a unique process where coming to the Armstrong firm is different than coming to some other firm. You want to make sure that you have a transformational audit. If you buy into this, some of you may say, I'm not going to do this. Things are working just fine. I'm going to continue exactly the way I am. Good luck to you. But for those of you who say, I understand what you're saying, and I would like to create a transformational experience. I would like for my law firm to be different than every other law firm out there. Then you need to do a transformational audit through the client's eyes. You take every single area where the client touches your firm, the marketing outreach, the receptionist experience, the initial consultation, the office experience, the follow through, the referral experience, the post transaction and the lifetime communication. And there may be a whole lot more. You create a form that has three columns in it. You put the task, what's the contact with the client? What is the way that the client is contacted? And then the next one is, this is how we do it right now. And then the third column is, how can we do it better? What would be a transformational experience? We introduced this to all of the Academy members, told them to go back, have a big staff meeting, and then go through this transformational audit. And it was the most amazing experience these attorneys told us about. They said that once they got into the staff meeting, the staff totally bought into the idea that we're going to create a new firm here. We're going to create a firm that really focuses on the clients. We're going to create a firm here that is transformational. And they provided all of the ideas, fresh cut flowers inside the lobby, never answer the phone more than th with more than three rings, um, muffins in the final signing. All of these things that sometimes didn't even cost a lot of money, but we filled out this transformational audit form, the entire staff bought into it, and they gradually uh, implemented all of the experiences they had. Now, 
That's the transformational sort of self-expression form that I talk to you, strategy number one. But you will not have a business if you're here on this cruise and money is not flowing into your office right now. Some of the members of the academy tell us they need to leave the office more often and go on vacation because they make more money when they're away from the office than they do when they're in there. True story. So if you're not making money while you're on this cruise, then you do not have a business. You've got a J-O-B, you've got a job. And if you like to have a job, however well paying it is, that's fine. But that job, that business will only grow to the extent that you have the capacity to meet with clients yourself. You need to create systems in which all of the people in your office are going to make sure that money is generated when you're not there. You must practice leverage with the work of others. Now, what kind of work are we talking about? We're talking about unique ability work. And what is unique ability work? That's the kind of work that lights you up in the morning. And I'll just put all of these on here so you can see what I'm talking about. Things that create energy rather than drain it. Things where you produce superior results. Things when you wake up in the morning and you look at your calendar and you say, I'm doing these things today. And you have a smile on your face. You want to get to work. You want to do it. Is that your experience of your days? Well, it's not the experience of professionals that we meet with. They dread getting in the office. Sometimes they sit in the parking lot and they just kind of steal themselves for going into the office because they've got, they know that they have things that they have to do that they hate doing. Your job when you leave this cruise, if you buy into all of this, is set a date on your calendar where you are only going to do the things where you are superior that light you up and that generate revenue for the firm. And I suggest you get a time log and you start making a log of everything you do. Now I know I'm going to say you should create a time log and I know that virtually no one in this room will do that. But if you do, I can promise you there will be a revelation of how you spend your time. And you'll find that you're spending time making coffee, picking up mail, making deposits. You'll, you'll be doing bookkeeping, you'll be writing ad copy, you'll be proofing documents, you'll be doing all of those things that are necessary to be done in a firm. Now, why do you do those things? You do them because you don't feel you've got anybody to delegate them to. And so you hold them for yourself. What I'm suggesting to you is something radical, that you get rid of all of those things so that your task in the firm is to meet with clients, develop of those close personal relationships, do all of the things that we've talked about, that looking at getting a sale to get a client, that's what you'll be doing, not all of the other things that are up there on it. And by the next year, you want to get rid of everything. Say you your three principal goals in your office are being a great presenter, doing strategic thinking, and initial consultations with clients. Those are noble goals. That's all in line with having personal deep relationships. Now, if you only did those things when you woke up in the morning and you were really good at those things, would you light up? Of course you would. But you could get rid of all the other things, the document creation, the final signing, the ordering of supplies, bookkeeping, and bank deposits. But then you say, well, who's going to do all of that work? I don't have a staff of thousands to do all of that. I've just got to suck it up and do all of that and sacrifice the opportunity time to really meet with clients and create relationships or do better marketing. Well, what you want to do is you've got to get your staff involved. You've got to enroll them in a new way of looking at the office, a new way of looking at their careers, a new way of looking at their lives, a way that they've never looked at their lives before. It's not coming to work every day to get a paycheck, but it's coming to work every day to get the opportunity to do the things that they love to do. You may not like to do bookkeeping, but there are lots of people who love the detail work of bookkeeping. You may not like the idea of proofing documents, but there are people who love that. And what you want to do is make sure that you get all of those people in your office enrolled in the idea that you will have unique abilities and the skills and temperament of each person in the firm will be there. 
Get them all tested. There's tests like the Colby, the Strength Finder, personnel profiles. All of these are simple and expensive tests where you can tell if you've got somebody who is effervescent and outgoing and you've got them behind a computer all day. That does not light up somebody who does that. But if you've got somebody who's a detail-oriented person dealing with clients, that doesn't light them up. You've got to take the time to get them tested and find the people for each position. And I'll tell you, if you do that, you will never have a problem with your staff ever again. Your staff will love to come to work every day, and you'll have what we call unique ability teams. OK, maybe you've bought into this so far. I want to have unique abilities for myself. I want to have unique abilities for everybody in the firm. But how do I do that? Jim Collins in his good, great book, Good to Great, said leaders of great companies start with the who. They don't start with the what or the why, they start with the who. They get the right people on the bus, the wrong people off the bus, and the right people in the right seats. That's what you've got to do. And most of you just take anybody who applies for a job, has got minimal qualifications, you put them in your office, and you suffer the consequences because you cannot give them the kind of jobs that are going to be essential for the firm's growth. So where do you find the people that are right for your bus? Well, if you're like most firms, what you do is you draw a radius around where you're, lo you're located. Most people will drive, what, 20, 25 miles to go to work in an office? So you're essentially saying that the radius of 20 to 25 or 30 miles, you're going to get the people with the best skills and the best work ethic in your office every day. Well, that's absolutely the most ludicrous kind of statement you could make. What are the chances that inside Chicago, within that radius, that there are the best people in the world to do things for your office? And you say, but wait a minute, they've got to come into the office, don't they? Well, maybe they do. But let's look at the things that happen for your, your employees, for your staff, for your team members. The constraints to full productivity in America are just unbelievable. There's union rules, pension and profit sharing plans, unemployment taxes, mandated lunch and regular breaks, overtime rules, mandatory taxes, ability to sue for workers' comp, vacation and sick leave, workplace hostility, sexual harassment, health insurance, maternity and family leave laws, regular performance reviews, and let's not forget those special expected year-end bonuses. That's the environment you're working in right now. Isn't that true? When you bring somebody in, and if you're in a state like we are in California, they are just overwhelmingly difficult to circumvent. You cannot have an employee work more hours than eight hours in a day, even if they want to. So let's try a radical approach. Who actually has to be in your office every day? What are the people who absolutely, positively must reside in a cubicle, in an office, on your premises? Because most of you have never thought about that. You just think that everybody has to be there. Well, that's not the way it has to be in 2013. What we want you to do is make a list of every task your firm performs. Every task and every function. Break it down into subparts if necessary. Next to each job component, mark an I for in-house and an O, and I always want to say outhouse, but it's really for outsourced. So you want an I for people that are in-house, and you want an O for what can be outsourced. And some of you have heard the word outsourcing, and you're just not familiar with it. You're uncomfortable with it. You want to have everyone around you physically present. And this is what you do. Here's a, here are the firm functions for an estate planning law firm. The greet the clients, answer the phones, meet with clients, document production, final signing, marketing, trust administration, Medicaid planning, bookkeeping, and miscellaneous administration. Fill in your own functions if you're a financial advisor. You know what those are. You know what you need inside your office. And then you say, which ones of those absolutely, positively have to be inside the office? Well, somebody has to greet the clients and answer the phones, right? And so you think that that's just one function. Not so quick. Answering the phones can be outsourced. Greeting the clients, I agree, you have to be there to do that. 
How about bookkeeping? All of those things. How many here are doing bookkeeping for their firms right now? Are actually doing the bookkeeping? Any of you? None may admit it. Some of you probably are because you don't have somebody else to do it. Bookkeeping can be done. How about marketing? Marketing, you think the person has to be in-house? They don't. Marketing is just a collection of various tasks, a menu of activities that a firm needs to do. You can outsource all of that. What about document production? They don't have to be in the office. They can tunnel in through RDC, re remote desktop, or VPN, and they can actually be like they're in a cubicle next door and print the documents right in your office as though they were on, on site and they may be half a world away. What are more functions to consider? I won't go over all of those, but you can see there's so many things, the list is endless of functions that do not have to be in the office. And some of you may say, well, that's great. I love that idea of outsourcing to get the best people to do that, but outsourcing is very expensive. How can I afford to do that? Well, this is the revelation I'm gonna to give to all of you today. And it's something that we live at the academy. And if you take nothing home today but this, then it will be worth your while. There are people out there around the world with the top skills, the top work ethic, the top of everything, just waiting for you to hire them. And they're on freelance sites, Elance, Odesk, Guru.com, VWorker, and 99designs. And I'm sure there are others. We use Elance and Odesk all of the time. And it's so easy to do. Do the people have the skills I need? You bet there's every skill that you can possibly imagine. People with advanced degrees, people with no degrees but lots of experience, people from all over the world that live in different economies and require different levels of payment. This is, I love this slide because this slide is the example that every owner here knows all about. Do you ever watch a person when they come on board and they're setting up their office with their computer and with their desk? How many people actually put their desk in, in the office so that somebody walking by would be able to look at their monitor? Nobody does that. That monitor is always facing them because they don't want anybody to know what they're doing. You know, 70% of all porn site visits are done during working hours. And just don't get me started with all of these other activities like Facebook and Twitter, all of these non-activities, business activities. So what they do is they hide what they're doing and what about these people that are not in your office? How much control do you have of them? That can't be a good deal. You have more control right now than you do on the cubicle next to your office. For example, on Odesk and Elance, they have a thing called the work diary. And they take a picture of the screen of the person randomly every six minutes. So you get to see what the person is doing. And if they're not working on the task that you gave them, they do not get paid for it. Wow, what a novel concept. No paying for somebody at the water cooler. No paying for somebody on a day off. No paying for somebody to do something else. I'm not suggesting you get rid of all your employees. What I'm talking about is you create the core employees inside of your office. Those are absolutely essential. Uh, there, there's a lot of them. Elance, Odesk. Uh, Odesk and Elance. So who handles all the paperwork? Oh, I can't be responsible for people halfway around the world. Well, Odesk, Elance, and all the others, they, they do all the paperwork for you, and they take a 10% cut. So if you pay somebody $11, the person gets 10, Odesk gets $1. And how do you get started doing something like this? It's very simple. You go on, you log on, you put a bid in that you want a person that does the following things, and people immediately from all over the world will start responding to you. How about compensation? Do you have to pay more? Well, the whole idea is to get the best talent, not the cheapest, but in reality, you will pay a lot less. We took the example of a $40,000 graduate that's in-house in America. That's the pay. Those are the benefits, the taxes, the health insurance, the equipment and rent. The work hours per month, $173.34. Total hourly compensation, almost $25. 
If I go online, I can find freelance people in the United States, we're not talking about offshore, in the United States, that will do the same thing, who are tested, who have had other people actually grade their work put, output, and they are from 10 to $16 an hour. The Academy, this is our global workforce of 39. We've got people in Canada, Illinois, Washington, California, Florida, Ohio, New York. We've got people in, two in Canada, we got one in Jamaica, we've got three in India, and we've got nine in the Philippines. We practice this. We have the most extraordinary team of workers, some in the office and some outside of the office. So this is a world in transition. I don't have a whole lot of time, but I would just want to recap here. There's an exciting world that awaits us if you embrace it. If you do the things that you've always been doing, then technology is going to destroy you. I promise you. It will take away your business. So you want to be, people are hungry for deep emotional relationships, as we said before. And you view your practice as an instrument of your self-expression. And if you do all of that, ladies and gentlemen, there are huge opportunities ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thanks.